when things get really tough, your, your, your options are find a way to win. Score the points when you get to the left. Do this, this, and this. You know, your, your mind's operating that way if you're, if you're a competitor. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, that's good wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast presented by Spartan Combat. This is your host, Ryan Warner. Our guest today is John W. Smith. This interview was recorded in October of 2020 and has never been released to the public. John covers his brother Pat's high school and college career, as well as John's competitive career in 1992 and into coaching in the early 90s. Enjoy it. We know you will. Fan of the week goes to OJ Pauly. That's OJ Pauly on the gram. His actual name is Paul, and he's a baseball historian. Thank you for the support. And folks, if you love this podcast, please consider supporting our sponsor, Spartan Combat. They make this podcast possible. You've heard me say it a million times. They're hosting a national tournament this May 20th through the 23rd. If you are a wrestler in the southeastern U.S., check out this tournament. If you know someone who's a wrestler, check it out. And if you're not... Spartan Combat has some incredible gear on their site, spartancombat.com. Check it out now. And that's it. Let's get to the interview with the great John Smith. How would you describe Pat as a high school wrestler? Mm. You know, one of those guys that you're going, you got to get him. You know, he's going to have an impact immediately, a four time national champ. I mean, nobody can see that coming, you know. Um, just one of those kids that you're like, and you're close to, obviously being his brother, and you know he's got all the right attitude, and he's he's growing up with his a brother that's reeling off some championships and doing some things, and it's and it's having no effect on his personality, no effect on what he wants to do. It's like the perfect match. Like, yes, we want you, Pat, because you're not worried about nothing. You want to win yourself. You know, um, and not you know worrying about trying to live up to you know someone. So for that reason, uh, Pat excelled in high school. You know, I mean, really, uh, I, I say it often. Pat's an overachiever. You know, um, and he was an overachiever while he wrestled at Oklahoma State. You know, um, you know he 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 worked hard. You know, he wasn't the the you know he might get, get pissed off at me, but wasn't the most talented guy. He really didn't have my speed, my flexibility. Uh, he, he was different, you know, and um, he, he worked and, and earned everything that uh, he accomplished. And when he came in, Bob Dellinger told him, actually at the Hall of Fame there, he's like, listen, you're a good kid, red shirt, get some matches, come back next year. Pat said that that really fueled him. And really pissed him off, and that's why he you know, fought so hard. You know, why do you think it upset him so much? Oh, just you know, probably with Pat, just Bob. Bob was a, close to all of us, you know, close to our family. And here you have someone close to our family going, "Nah, you probably need a red shirt. You're not ready." Well, I'll show you. You know, you know whether you're red shirt or not. You don't want. To, I'm sure Pat didn't want to hear. I'm not ready. I I can beat anyone. You know. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Pat was thinking. You know, and. Um, he did show us, 
you know. Um, and, you know, I just, he's just compet he was as competitive as anyone I've ever been around. That's what Leroy says, yeah. is that his toughness was just another level. It was a love, another level. That's why I said he was an overachiever. You know, he's, he, he overachieved. I mean, when you look at him, you just go, you know, well, anyone that wins four national championships being the first one, I mean, they're overachievers. But he overachieved in, in his freshman year. You know, he overachieved in his, in his probably his sophomore and his junior year as well. You know, maybe his season that didn't, that, that wasn't perfect, um, you know, was maybe towards the end of his senior year, you know. Maybe he had some closer matches than I hoped, but so have we all been in situations where, you know, how many times you walk off the mat and you go, I should have beat him worse, you know. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, um, I think Pat probably did that a little bit. But he also had a lot of pressure, you know, and and he uh, sometimes you just you have to win ugly, and Pat knew how to win ugly. It reminds me of you telling Bruce Burnett that I'm ready to win by one. Yeah. In '92. That's right, you know, and and just winning ugly, you know. Um, yeah, I didn't have a great tournament. <laughs> I didn't wrestle well, you know, um, but I knew I was going to have to win, you know, uh, ugly and. And I think for Pat, just, um, you know, dug deep and, and, and uh, we'll get some really good wrestlers that had a lot of success. And like you said, just really tough. And you look at the guys he beat, incredible list of, you know, uh, national champions, and we can name them all. But the thing that really interests me about Pat is going into his last year, he assumed going into 93 that he was going to win his fourth win it four and four years and be done. Then the NCAA sanctions come out, and he has to redshirt. And he says he actually almost went to Arizona State. Um, what do you remember about that debate between transferring and staying? Well, I knew he wasn't leaving. <laughs> I knew my brother was trying to get him. <laughs> so um, I don't know what Leroy said about it, but I remember it. Um, he wasn't going anywhere. He might have thought he was for a while, but... Um, uh, but we also didn't know a lot of things, right? And, and um, didn't know how the health of the program was it going to be healthy. Is this, you know? And I think in the end, I worked really hard to reassure my mom, my dad, and my, as well as you know, people around us that we're going to be fine. We're going to come through this, and 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 there's no need to, you know, uh, something like that happening. Um, Things fall apart quickly, you know, and um, it's a real danger, dangerous time for your program. And, and for us, it was dangerous, you know, and, and um, you know, I'm really, I'm really loyal to those guys that stayed, you know, like Pat and, you know, um, Alan Freed, who actually gave up a year, you know, um, those guys were were real important for us to be able to bounce back immediately or or take a hit for six, seven years and trying to bring something back, you know. So um, those guys always need to be recognized as true cowboys, you know. Those guys really, Pat and, and Alan Freed especially, really key time for us to keep them. Yeah, and Alan Freed, he literally lost a year. Like lost you a year. That's, you don't get any of those. No. He told me it was worth it to be a part of a winning team, though, versus yeah, winning at Ohio and, State. Yeah, and I hope it was worth it in the long run now, you know. I think, you know, I mean, we sometimes that the national championship team is, yeah, it is the goal, right? But I think, you know, 25 years later, 30 years later, your, your experiences and, and the things that, that you got to experience on those teams are, are as valuable as, any, as winning medals, as winning championships. Yeah. So, um, and, and I'm and, and I feel good about where Allen is uh, and, and Pat is about Oklahoma State wrestling. You know, I feel really good about it because uh, they did make a a big commitment to us, bigger we, than, than bigger than than any student athlete that can make. You know, you're giving up a year when you're you're ranked number one, two in the country. Yeah. You know, um, that's hard to do. 
I mean, especially now when we're in the age of the, the selfish age, so to speak, they'd be gone in a second. <laughs> yeah, and they, they don't think of anything bigger than them. There, there's several of them. I, I shouldn't say that's that not, it's not all of them, but yeah, you know, these guys thought of something, you know. I mean, the only way you would stay is this is bigger than me, right? Yeah. Oklahoma State wrestling and where I'm at, it's bigger than me, you know. And when you start thinking you're bigger than that, then it's kind of when uh, you don't think, you don't really think things out very well, you know. And at that time, you had just become the full-time head coach. And last time we met in September, you had, we talked about the year you were co-head coach and what a disaster that was um, for you personally, not for the team. They still got yeah. second. But now you're the head coach full-time. You guys go like three and eight, four and eight, something like that. How humbling was that to go from having a parade thrown in your hometown in September to January? Mm -hmm. You can't win a dual meet. Yeah. Um, well, that was the year that we couldn't go to the Big 12 or NCAA championship. So, you know, we redshirted everyone and, and, um, uh, and we put a dual meet team out there, you know, um, that a lot of people didn't think we should. You know, just go to tournaments. You're not wrestling the Big 12. You're not wrestling the national championship. Um, there's part of me going, probably shouldn't have done it. But then there's a bunch of me going, yeah, because I saw some of the guys that got a chance to wrestle and what they did following it, you know. Um, a couple of them ended up being long high school still long high school coaches a lot of years they put in you know and it may have been that 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 opportunity to compete that year um yeah it wasn't a great team i mean when you think about it it's um you're you putting you know we had we had four walk-ons that was starting that year five five walk-ons that starting this that year and somewhere mid mid-season we had to go pull someone out of eskimo joe's that we knew wrestled because we had our, our 25 pounder that got injured. We had to pull them out of Eskimo Joe's and uh, train them up for a couple of weeks. And when they, they ended up starting for Oklahoma state in some dual meet somewhere. Um, and they didn't get pinned or teched. I don't know what the tech was Ben, or if there was a tech, but I, I just remember, uh, I think it was just a major decision. And, um, I don't think it mattered in the duel. I think we lost anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like going into it, you knew it was going to be hard. And Well, you know, I could have made the easy decision and going, we're not wrestling duels. We're not going to put a hammer to Oklahoma State. We're not going to have the worst season in the Oklahoma State's history. Um, we're not going to do that. We're going to go and we're going to wrestle all these open tournaments. Um, you know, and... You know, if I had to do it all over again, we'd wrestle the dual meets. Amen. You know, and we would, you know, um, I'm glad there's guys that had an opportunity to compete, and, and some of them would have never had that opportunity. And, um, you know what, the crowds wasn't bad. Um, I, got, I got some, I got some um, pushback from... I'm just losing a little bit, you know. Um, you know, people assuming that you should win everything, even uh, even <laughs> when you're when you got half a team, you know. So anyway, um, it was hard. It wasn't easy. But then the next year, you guys are ranked two. You go out to Penn State for the first duel of the year in Rec Hall. They're number one. They had been beaten Iowa a couple times, and you know, '94 was a year where it was really a toss-up for the team race. You guys go out there and beat Penn State at Rec Hall. Mm -hmm. You're number one in the nation. How were your nerves going into that duel at Rec Hall versus when you were an athlete? Oh, you know, those early years, I, you know, just uh, I think, you know, they were easier for me because I looked at things as, as uh, I don't know, as the Olympics being the ultimate, you know, and here I am just wrestling a dual meet. I've come to appreciate that way more, you know. Um, but I think coming out of the Olympics and, and doing some of the things, you just, we can do this, this isn't tough, you know. We can go anywhere and, and you know, I think I, I still had a little bit of that gamemanship that, 
that I left on the mat that I, I'm bringing into my coaching a little bit more. Um, so there was some things I needed to appreciate more that I wish I would have because I missed some time that I, that I do regret as a coach um, that I really enjoy and, and value more than ever now. Um, so I probably wasn't, didn't have a lot of anxiety at all, you know, not like it is now, you know. Um, and it's a way more funner for me now than it ever was then. Why is that, you think? Oh, I just, you know, just like I said, you know, I, I, um, I didn't know how long I was going to do it. I didn't know if it was a career for me. I didn't know a lot of things. Uh, I, I probably, I had a lot of choices to go do something else. And, and so I'm going to do it, but, you know, I'm not too worried about it, you know. Um, so just viewing it differently, you know, and um, um, which is was good in some way, but uh, uh, definitely looking back, I regret that, you know, I didn't have the feeling I have now to really be able to embrace everything. You know, even winning the championship was a little bit of a, good we need to win them all the time you know you didn't realize how hard they are <laughs> some more gratitude. yeah you just didn't realize the the competitiveness and how how challenging they really are you know um and so um that's kind of how i viewed everything and i think it was probably good for some of the student athletes you know not all of them how do you think you've changed as a coach from then versus the 94 season to now Outside oh i value some... things way more you know, I just, I don't overlook things, you know, just, I, I don't assume that this stuff happens all the time. That, you know, I, I take the time for the special moments, you know, I take the time for the special performances and, and especially individually, you know, when, when you have guys that really had outstanding seasons and I just don't assume that that's just going to happen all the time. And, um, you know, slow down and, you know, smell the roses a little bit, you know, and just enjoy the, the moments and when there's really uh, great, you know, um, great years, you know. You know, I've come to learn, really, you know, you can have a really great year as a team and, and not win a championship. You know, forever I thought that that, that was impossible, you know. Um, and so, you know... Um, recognizing what you have and what they did as individuals, you know, judging them from their level. What's, what's my team like? What's my talent level like, you know? Um, and, and really that 94 team was overachievers, you know? They were overachievers to win that. Um, of course, Branch and, and some of those guys, um, uh, three champions that year. Pat and, and uh, Branch and um, Free, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so, do you think you still win it without Branch winning it? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. I didn't look no. at the points, but no, I don't think so. It took it took three champions because Perler wrestled under the seed and mm -hmm. okay. So you know, obviously going into '94, you told me last time Pat was a massive focus for you for the whole country going into it. And uh, he said that Saturday before the nationals, or before the finals, team title was wrapped up. You guys had three in the finals. He said that you and him went to go see Red October. Yeah. Do you, do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> when you're doing something like that, are you talking about wrestling? What are you doing? Oh, he up? wasn't in a good place, you know. I didn't think he was in a good place. The leading up to the nationals, I didn't think he was in a good place. You know, I, I don't know if I told you the story on Branch and mm -hmm. him. Yeah, you know, I just didn't think he was in a great place. He struggled a little bit in some of his preliminary matches, and although the scores were a little bit, they were separated, I saw what was kind of building with him a little bit. And um, um, and again, he's getting ready to do something that, that, you know, for, at the time, you know, um, 70 years, almost 70 years, you know, I guess 70, would it be 70? Yeah, 70 years before... You know, um, yeah, it's probably a little less than that, but you're getting ready to do something that's never been done, and, and there's a lot of attention on it, and um, let's make sure you go out there and go for it, right? Mm -hmm. Let's leave nothing. I mean, you don't have to wrestle great and win this. I think I, I even said that to him. 
you know, we don't have to have the perfect match. Okay, you're good enough to separate the score and win it when you have to win it, right? Um, and preparing him to win by one, you know, um, because it wasn't going to be much more than that. Yeah. I don't know what the score finally ended up. Like five threes? Uh, yeah, five like three, yeah. Yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be, you know. On another day, it might have been, you know. Um, tonight, um, you're, you're going to have to you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to win one that's going to be tight, and you might have to get a takedown in the third to win it. Man, it's so yeah. reminiscent to '92 to me. It's crazy. Um, Say that again. It's reminiscent to your '92 season yeah. in a number of ways. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, Chuck White told a story last night that I would be doing the wrestling world justice if I didn't show you, um, <laughs> that I just got to oh get, get your opinion on. Um, okay, so this is at the 92 trials in Pittsburgh. And all right, this is right after the... Okay, so this is after the Fisher match. The one I got beat? Yeah. some reason but you know I didn't think too much about it and then all of a sudden the match gets going and you know he ends up getting beat by Fisher and it's kind of like what the hell just happened <laughs> you know how did you find him after that match we were driving to get something to eat between sessions and he was sitting on the curb yeah. on the curb on the curb by himself so we rolled down the window you want to go eat and he got in the car and one the so think about this. He's getting ready to go wrestle his second match for the uh, Olympic trials. We ate at Wendy's. Wow. So when you saw him on the side of the road, was he in his singlet or his warm-ups? He's in a warm-up. So he leaves. He loses it. You know, he gets upset. He's out on the road, and you guys really didn't know where he was at at that time? No. No clue. Just by chance ran into him. So you get him in the car. What's he say in the car? Does he say anything? Is he crying? No, he wasn't crying. He didn't say a lot in the car. And uh, while we were eating lunch, he like at least looks at me and is like, so, so what do you think? And I'm thinking like, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> All these gold medals and why are you asking me what I think? And I just, the only thing I told him, I said, you just don't got the eye of the tiger right now. That's the only difference I see in you. You said that to him? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did he say? Huh? He just kind of looked at me and kind of, what do you mean? And I'm like, you know, you're not, your shots aren't 100%. You know, it just, it wasn't, he didn't look like John, like where everything had 110% intent when he went. You know, he's kind of like 98, you know, and that's not who he is. How did... Hmm. Heavy that's, moments. That's funny. I haven't heard, I haven't seen that and. Or I haven't even talked about that, you know. Um, that was about, uh, I want to say I was probably about three quarters of a mile from the, from the facility when they pulled up next to me. And I was, I was sitting on the curb and I didn't know what I was doing out there. I, I just know I, I took off running and or walking and you know and then I was sitting sitting on the curb and you know um, they pulled up and my dad was with him too and my mom was with him you know my dad and mom was and they did they just picked me up and I didn't I, you know I didn't know we went to Wendy's I didn't really care probably then but um, there wasn't much that got you know I, I don't I don't remember him saying you don't look good. I mean that wouldn't have affected me. I knew I wasn't wasn't good right now, right then, you know. Um, but that ex, that that was unusual that you know they just pull up and I get in and we go eat, you know, <laughs> like, just somewhere down the road, you know. Um, I, there wasn't much said. There wasn't. I mean, my dad knew where I was at for sure, you know. Um, uh, I wasn't in a good place, and, uh, and and I think you know when you think of that, when you say you're not in a good place, I think it just means, you know, um, things aren't clicking very well. You know, um, 
and you're going to have to make it a better place. And you make it a better place by winning matches how you have to, you know. And, I, I, you know, it's just nice that you know that you can do that. I think it's real important, you know. And um, I don't think at that time in those trials I was punishing myself. I think, you know, saying I, had, I didn't work out enough, I wasn't, you know, I didn't stay focused enough on what I needed to do. I was coaching all season. I did some things I shouldn't have done. Um, we, we know all that, right? Um, I just think that just in life in general, um, there's days that they're not going to be good. So what are you going to do? You know, is history going to change because I don't feel good today? You know, um, to me, you know, those are the those are the things that um, you want your children, you want your athletes, you want you know, your friends to know about you, mm -hmm. you know. I'll be there when it's tough, you know, uh, whether that means you need a friend, whether that means, you know, you need a coach. Um, and at one time in my career, it was, it was about being tough uh, when things aren't going well as an athlete. It's such a hard time to, to pull through, especially when the pressure's on you to already win. I mean, at that point, you said, only gold will do, and when you get to yeah. gold, it's not even the same joy you had. You were wrestling because you felt like you had to, because you couldn't live with yourself to not be a six-time world champ. So that's a lot of pressure. What kind of conversations did you have with yourself? Like, what was your self-talk before match three of Fisher, or any big match for that matter, when you're in your head by yourself and you're, you're talking to yourself? Oh, I think, I think you just, you're, you're uh, the second match was a hard match, you know, and the third was hard. Um, you know, you just you just know that they're going to be hard, you know, and you're just accepting it, mm -hmm. you know. And and um, I think, you know, getting beat that first match, I wasn't sure it was going to be that hard. Following that match, I knew they were going to be hard. Mm -hmm. So I needed that, you know. Um, and Fisher, I'm going to tell you, man, um, there was something about him that I've never felt. I mean, I felt a better wrestler than I've ever ever felt from him, mm -hmm. and and even looking at his skills and some of the things he did in the match, I mean, he he was he was definitely a different wrestler than I ever than I ever wrestled before. Um, but I know what I was telling myself following that first loss, and even down a, a mile down the road, and they happened to just pull up next to me. Um, I was probably you know, making, helping them not feel so uncomfortable around me, you know. Um, I knew where I was at. I knew what was going to, what was going to, uh, what, what needed to take place in the next couple matches. Um, and losing that first one, it prepared me for the next two. Mm. I knew they were going to be tough. And I knew I was going to have to scrap and I was going to have to fight and, and I wasn't going to feel things like I normally feel them. My, my leg lace wasn't there. My gut, you know, there was things that wasn't there that just, hey, they're not going to be there. You're going to have to, you're going to have to scrap for each takedown, each, each score, and and uh, any turn will be a bonus. And by that time in my career, I was probably more known for my turns than anything, as much as low single leg, you know. So, um, yeah, they're satisfying moments. I mean, I wouldn't change anything. I just Mm -hmm. It's good to it's good to know, and it's good to know that that you can you can bring a whole another level uh, when it, even when it's uh, looks a little bit ugly from what you're used to doing. Yeah, and it, that was a a twelve month period where um, you know Pat had some battles with Ray Miller, you had some battles with John Fisher. Then that summer, you go to the Olympics in '92. But before you do, I got to ask, how did the LA Times interview set up? Did hmm. he contact you? I don't know. That is one of the. I don't know. You know, it's one of those. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think at that time, you know, they're they're looking at uh, the three or four athletes uh, in in the world in the world, maybe even in this, just in the country, that are, you know, um, being a Solomon Award winner. These are four. I mean, they did probably did four or five interviews with four or five different athletes and. One dad, dad, that guy caught me on the wrong day. <laughs> so I'll just say that. Um, 
yeah, I mean, it wasn't a good day that day, and 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 not that I not that I I knew it wasn't a good day that day because I really don't know. I just know the things I said in that article, they're true, but um, I probably didn't word them like I wish I would have. Uh, it's like I don't I don't give a damn right now, you know. Um, Things aren't going well, you know. They wasn't going well. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah, I, I get asked about that article often. Well, just the fact that you would do an interview before Barcelona to me says a lot about. Well, one, it seems like you know, LA Times is a huge paper, so you did it, but the interview itself is indicative of your mood at the time. Yeah. And that whole summer was pretty turbulent. Yeah, it was turbulent. And we talked about it last time. It reminds me a lot of when Michael Jordan was trying to win his, and that book, The Jordan Rules, came out. Showing all this, all the the inter demons of Jordan. That article showed a lot of your inner demons yeah. at the time. And it's kind of yeah. you know, for the whole world to see. So you go into Barcelona, and the one thing I didn't ask last time when he wrestled Reynoso, was that the same day as the finals? No. Um, I don't know. I don't think it was. I think I came back the next day and won the finals. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was the next day. Okay. Going into the Reynoso match, did you know the situation? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it was probably, you know, you know, just, I, I, I often think of I, that, that moment, you know, because it really... You know, there was something that there was something for me that was was missing um, for a long time, following the, following that Olympic gold medal. Uh, there was something missing for a long time. You know, I, I wasn't really, you know, you, you, you know, you think of winning the gold medal, you know, you think of happiness, joy. You know, there was something missing for me. Um, and it was that match. That match took a little bit of the gold from me. Um, and I think because I just, you know, I did the minimum. But I will say this, you know, that um, I didn't need to know that. And I shouldn't have found out. You don't need to tell a, a five-time world champion that, that um, he needs to score one point, you know. Um, you don't need to tell them that, you know, uh, not not somebody that's that has historically scored a lot of points, and you know, so you know, Reynoso was tough enough for me that I needed, I need, I didn't need to know that, you know, um, so um, it really it really affected uh, how I thought when I realized I'm in a tough match. Mm -hmm. It really affected me. That's what affected me more than anything in that match is, I, you know, when things get really tough, your, your, your options are find a way to win. Score the points when you get to do this, this, and this. You know, your, your mind's operating that way if you're, if you're a competitor. Um, but when you know you, have an, you can opt out, um, that's not healthy. And so when, when things got really tough in that match, um, all I could think of was a point, you know. And I wouldn't think about winning. Especially since you I was already, thinking about winning, get, getting that point. Yeah. I mean, you had already had such a history with Reynoso anyway. We knew it was going to be a conflicting styles matchup. And it, I've seen you beat him 15 to 2. I've yeah. seen you beat him by 1. You know, yeah. so it's a re that's a really interesting cat to watch those matches with you and him. Yeah, there was a there was a conflict of style between he and I. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just um, just odd. He felt odd to me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and when I say odd, there, there was guys that beat him pretty consistently at my weight that I'd tech fall, you know. Um, but for me, it was a conflict. There was a real conflict. So I didn't need anything. I don't know why anyone would tell me that. You know, I didn't need any. I needed to go into that match, and, and I needed to focus on 
this is a battle match. You know, I had a 2-1 match or 3-1 or 3-2 with the North Korean, you know. I think it was in earlier rounds. It was tough. He was a tough kid. Um, I, I struggled all summer, right? Um, I, need, I need everything I have. I, I, don't, I don't need some excuse to, to go run to, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and for that reason, you know, it's just, it, it, it never, it didn't sit with me for a long time very well. I'm, when I say a long time, I'm talking maybe, 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 you know, somewhere around 2008, 10, I'm, I start to appreciate that gold medal. That's a long time. Yeah. But, you know, early that summer, when, when I realized, you know, coming off the illness, we talked about that illness a little bit I had that really set me back, and I didn't think it did. And it, once, I, once I got into really training, I realized it was, it, it affected me, my, my, just my endurance as well as my, just my health. Um, but I made a commitment, um, and I don't know if I said this to you, but I, I remember making a commitment that I'm going to go 36-0 and 0 undefeated in World and Olympic competition. And that was my goal. It wasn't winning the Olympic gold medal. It wasn't trying to make the team. It's here. I need to have something that's going to, that's, that's bigger than the Olympic gold medal. I need something because another medal may not do it for me uh, where I'm at, you know. And so I really made that commitment that that's what I want to be known for is that in world and Olympic competition, John Smith went 36 and zero against the best wrestlers in the world. Mm. That was, that was what, what I had my, my uh, sight set on. It, it, it really wasn't to win a gold medal. And, and those sites were set before Fisher's matches, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I, this is part of the process for me to be able to do this, you know. So it kind of took that pressure off of maybe, you know, some of the things I'd said earlier, you know, is there's only one medal I can win, you know. And, and maybe saying some of those things, I realize I need something bigger than this. Dude, you've done put enough pressure on yourself by saying that. You know? Was that after 88 when you made that goal or before 88? No, this, this I made uh, my last year. You know, when I got back and, and, I, and I got, you know, season ended at Oklahoma State and I realized I'm in a little bit of trouble. You know, uh, I made it my last year that I want to go 36 and 0 you know, or, or undefeated, you know, it would have been 36 and 0. Yeah. I want to go undefeated in world Olympic competition, you know. Um, so losing that match kind of set me back a little bit. And I think for several years, you know, I just didn't, uh, I'm glad I was able to realize, you know, over time realize some things that John, you know, you, know, you, you darn sure wouldn't want to be raising your kids thinking this way. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, that's a lot. You might do some real, you know, and just you get older and you, you realize that, you know, maybe, you know, now I look at it a little bit differently. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm proud that, you know, that um, I was able to finish my career winning. We talked about this last time. I believe that greatness and madness are next door neighbors and they yeah. borrow each other's ingredients, right? So you're real close to being crazy or great. And sometimes at the end it gets real blurry. And you talk about someone who's a six-time world champ not being able to let something go until 2008, that shows yeah. you how just how far that spectrum can go. Yeah, I know. It's, you know, well, and just, you know, you think of just competitors in general in all sports, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of wrestlers that walk away from NCAA championship. It takes them forever to get back. Yeah. You know, I mean, they just disappear, mm -hmm. you know, because they're poor performance, what they may think, you know. Let, well, let me share with any of you out there that are feeling that, it's a waste of time. And I wasted a, a lot of time from 1992 probably to 2008, you know, and, and probably said some silly stuff that 
is selfish and is immature um, and it's not healthy, right? I mean, and, and so, you know, um, because of that experience now for the last 10, 12 years, um, I always tell my guys, no regrets, man. We got to be doing this with no regrets, you know, and we, we have, we're going to have enough real regrets in our life that's not around the sport, you know, that you're going to have to deal with and, and get better at. And that may be, you know, your marriage. It may be raising a child. You know, it may be your, your personality in the workforce, whatever, right? And so um, let me tell you, man, just you, you, you got to walk from things, you know, and I've learned that, you know. You learn that as a coach here, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, not not winning the championship now, and you know, um, you know, twelve years, you know, um, you know, are you going to regret every season when you don't win, or, or you know, how how is your personality going to be? You know, are you going to be able to maintain a good personality as we're as you're going th through this experience. So, anyway. Um, it is a waste of time. I waste a lot of years uh, looking at things probably the way I shouldn't have after I was finished. Well, the one thing I wanted to jump back I didn't and... think it hurt anything, though, Okay. other than myself. But that's like a gnawing that you could just be driving down the road in the middle of summer and all of a sudden it hits and it could ruin the next four hours of your day. It just, yeah. that's annoying, you know? Yeah. It yeah. sucks. Um, but there was a time I wanted to go back to that we hit on the very first time in August. You had a loss of Jim Jordan you really process that the right way. Um, you had some dialogue with yourself. Am I ready? Am I going to make it? You know, I've been here three years now. I haven't won. So what was your goal going into the redshirt year? Make an Olympic team. Yeah, make a world team, actually. Um, a little bit of me was really concerned that I wasn't good enough. I think part of that wanting a redshirt too was knowing that I wasn't good enough you know um, I think the way um, the way Jim the way he beat me and I and I said it to you you know he was going to beat me that day he's going to beat me a week from now and he's probably going to beat me a month a month from now you know I, I wasn't going to beat that guy you know um, even though you know um, I found a way earlier in the season but um, I just felt like I was, I was overmatched. I was outmatched, you know. And I think a little bit of that was a hangover as, a, as going, into, going into that year. You know, Coach C didn't want me to redshirt. And, and, um, but I really felt like there was a level of maturity that, that I needed, you know. Um, And maybe a little bit nervous that it was all going too fast. Hmm. You know, I wrestled as a true freshman. I wrestled my sophomore year. You know, and, and a little bit of, uh, it's going too fast. I'm about done here. You know, and I wasn't, you know, I, I, thought, let's pull, I need to pull back a little bit. And, you know, uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm ready to go win a national championship going into my junior year, you know. Wow. <laughs> I, I probably wasn't. You know, if I didn't redshirt, if I didn't take that redshirt, I'm not sure I would have won. I'm not sure I would have developed some of the skills I developed. I wasn't sure that 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 empty feeling of the first time in your life, I'm not out on the mat wrestling. Instead, I'm in the stands. You know, I, I remember feeling that way. I'm sitting in the stands, and I'm like, you know, nobody's noticing me, or you know, I mean, I should be out there wrestling. You know, and all of a sudden, there's a real, there's a real feeling of, of, I'm a wrestler. <laughs> I need this sport, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, the red shirt was definitely the key to me. What happened in that black box of three months where you're drilling three times a day, you're working out with Jerry, what was the change? Just maturity. You know, you realize what you want. Um, you know, we, we often talk about the things we want to do, you know, and 
in the things that we want to accomplish. Um, but but in the end, how 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 bad do you want them? How bad do you want these things? Um, well, I hit a time in my life where uh, I'd lost the national championship the, the, the year before. Um, I walked off the mat knowing that I couldn't beat the guy now or probably in a month from now. Um, I'm not, not competing for my school. First time in my history that I'm not competing in a year. Um, and all that kind of just stirred me up to going, was worried about time. Like, this is your time. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't happen, you know, you're two years away from Olympian, Olympics. You only have two more years of college left. So for me, it was just a matter of time. And I think that you see it in people. I see it in some of my student athletes, you know, when they hit their junior year, or maybe there's, I see a whole different athlete, you know. For me, I was a different athlete, but there was a level of urgency to, to win that I wasn't going to be denied somehow. I mean, all of a sudden, I had an attitude that, and then I backed it up with a work ethic that between the two, it was turned into a lot of medals, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of gold medals. Yeah, and in, at that time, you talk about you're doing the physical work, you're emotionally ready, but you're also doing the mental work. So I've heard you talk about when you were really deep into it, you would have these invisible wrestlers appear in your head. Yeah. What did you mean by that? And how often would you visualize? I visualized a lot, man, you know, especially routine things that you want to do and um, just seeing yourself hitting leg laces, gut wrenches, low things, seeing yourself score, you know, um, you know, uh, and seeing some things that sometimes you don't want, you know. Um, you know, in 92, um, I remember going back to my room after Renoso, and I, I think it was that evening. I'm almost positive I wrestled Renoso the day before, but and if I didn't, I went back and took a nap after I got beat and came back that night, or I'm sure it was the next day I wrestled. But I remember waking up from the nap or from a long, from from uh, a long night of sleep, and you know, and I remember dreaming, had this dream that I got beat in the finals, and. I remember waking up and it feeling as real as anything I've ever felt in my entire life. This is a true story, and I've said I've told a few people this. I've never heard life. this one. And I just remember waking up, you know, and, and feeling that as real, and 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 I didn't know at the time, but I knew that something felt something felt odd, you know. It's like, did I lose? Did I lose the match? You know, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking and. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and, and I go down, and I'm taking a walk, and I'm like, no, I got the match today. I got the match today. And I read the newspaper. They had a, they had a, a newspaper that, was, uh, that they put out for all the athletes every day in the Olympic Village, a U.S. newspaper. And I remember opening it up and pulling that back to wrestling. No, no I, I wrestled today. I, I was relieved. I just felt relieved. And I think... That, that moment probably really helped me perform at a high level. It was just like a second chance here. You know, that's crazy. You know, and, and, and I don't, I mean, I, I just remember that it just felt so real to me. But there was something was telling me, ah, this and no, no, you're, you just dream. You, you, had a, you had a poor dream, you know. Uh, anyway, um, I just remember, though, it was a sense of relief. It was like. No, you haven't wrestled for the gold medal yet, you know. And there was just a, it was kind of like, I get a second chance here, you know. <laughs> I lost eight hours ago, you know, <laughs> somewhere uh, in my, you know. So anyway, um, I don't know why I got off on that. Well, I was just asking about the invisible head wrestlers and that yeah. dream and the visualization came yeah. up. Um, I mean, 
did you have that though? These like kind of faceless wrestlers in your head? Like mm -hmm. when you were really getting down with a low single and you were like completely isolated and you were really like a, like an 89, 90 where you're in the zone. Yeah. I was drilling all the time. Going through routines of just, with, you know, partners. All I had was a bunch of legs that I was shooting at, you know. Um, you know, and just having a lot of success, you know. I, I think anytime you're visualizing, you know, it's real important that you have success. Some people have struggle having success mm -hmm. when they're visualizing. I mean, I, I dominated everyone. <laughs> you know, it is hard to let those yeah, negative thoughts you know, I come in. I kicked everyone's ass, <laughs> even even Fadzayevs and and some of those guys that you know you're like, ah, I'd like to wrestle him. You know, well I did, I teched him like four, 40 times. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And the one guy I always struggled with because he was just you know that was around him. It was Nate Carr, you know, and he was a weight above me, but he was always powerful, and you know we'd work out some. Um, man, I whipped him a lot too. So uh, he was always, uh, you know, in, in in practice he was always the, the really challenged, you know, uh, ultimately challenged me, you know. And um, and I always said to myself, I need to I need to be whipping him. Well, the only place I ever whipped him was <laughs> the bazaar. <laughs> I never whipped him in practice. <laughs> Royce was telling a story about that in 90 when you guys went to Tokyo for the Worlds. You yeah. were wrestling Nate Carr, and, you know, he was big for the weight. Yeah. And uh, he said you guys would go, and you'd be messing around, and then something would get serious, and you'd grab your headgear, and you'd go, all right, what the hell, or what the crap, and like, you'd slam, and you're like, we're going for real now, and you guys would just go at it for like 20 minutes. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Classic. He was tough. Oh, my God. Just an incredible athlete. Randy said um, that he... That's the one guy he never even came close to taking out in practice, Randy Lewis. So yeah. whenever he wrestled Nate Carr, he wasn't, he wasn't even close. And he was only a weight up. You know, yeah. Um, he was good, yeah. And he was big, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I didn't very often move up and, and wrestle guys that were bigger, even in practice. You know, I, I was real, I didn't need to feel that, you know, that challenge all the time, you know, but for some reason with Nate, um, I needed to fill a little bit more. And I think we were a little thin on workout partners that year and it, we had to count on each other a lot leading up to that world championship, you know. And, and I will tell you this, um, that was my, that was um, probably my greatest performance that I had in my career was in Tokyo. Oh, you were lights out. I have yeah. a, a highlight clip here. Yeah, I mean, and you know, so that 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 was a you know when you think that you didn't have a lot of partners, and all of a sudden you know you're you're, you're limited. You'd think how can you be limited prior to the world championships? Well, um, I don't know, you know, but uh, sometimes it forces you to a you know a different different focus that gives you no reasons to have excuses, you know. How would the low single evolve in '90 from when you started it? Oh, it was it was it was full force on display, you know. Um, I think after that year in '91, I really started to feel a lot of development on some of the finishes, you know. Um, uh, so you know, it evolved, you know, and it's and it's and even today, you know, there's a lot of things that people do that. Um, that I never did, you know. Uh, you know, it's one of those tactics, the low single legs is one of those tactics in matches that you can't really prepare for. And I always knew that, like, you know, okay, I need to beat somebody that's got a two-on-one to my right arm, you know. Um, I need to beat somebody that ties up with the right hand to the head and inside ties with his left hand. Uh, that's what I got to be, you know. Um, I think you always have have a if you have an athlete, you always have a chance to help that athlete stop something, mm -hmm. like an inside tie to the head, like a two on one. I mean, I always told guys, you know, if somebody's going to come out and try to two on one me, 
and, and I get beat, I deserve to get beat. <laughs> if, you, if you're getting two on one, you know, then you're, you're reaching, you're doing just some terrible things to be getting, you know, getting pulled into two on one, you know. Um, but the, there's not a lot of tactics to stopping that low single leg. You know, and, and one of the reasons why is, you know, if you can't touch me, you can't stop anything, you know. So um, that's one thing I always knew was they can do all the work they want. But, you know, when, when you're just trying to keep me off your legs, I'm, I'm doing those practices every day. With good guys. With, well, yeah, with good guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. keep me off your legs. That's, you go back to what we were saying about Pat, you know. Yeah. And so in my mind, I, I always thought that, like, it don't matter what they're doing back at home. All they're trying to do is nothing. Do nothing. We, that's how we got to stop him. We, we, we got to do nothing. Got to, you know, drop on a knee or, you know. Um, in so my opinion, the best it. way to stop it is really through a scramble once you get in, and that really hadn't developed at that point because your finishes no. were so prolific. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. This, it'd be, yeah, this, yeah the, the scrambles today, how, how you know, that's, that's really a neat, uh, that's, that should be a podcast for you one day, is, is how much more exciting folk style got when, when scrambling really came in and, and the, um, and, you know, the, the ability to scramble and some of this just fascinating things that some of these athletes did for the last 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. None of that was in, in my time. And of course, it's limited because you can't expose your back. True. You know, some of these guys are dropping on their back, pulling a foot over, crawling up between the legs, and they're giving up point after point, you know. Right. So it's a little bit different, yeah. Yeah. Well, the one thing I want to ask you about, Coach, and we'll, we'll wrap up in five minutes here. I want to do a section on your endorsements because you were the first guy to have your own instructional tape. How low can you go, mm -hmm. right? We had how low can you go two, but how low can you go one came out. Um, I guess my question is who approached you for that and how did that get going? Dave Bennett. Um, you know Dave? Uh -uh. Dave Bennett was uh, actually an eye doctor out of, um, out of Washington. Um, ended up, he was a, a good coach. Um, he uh, he coached, uh, uh, you know, as a as a hobby uh, when he was practicing. Um, he was in Kennewick, Washington. I'd go up there every year and do him a clinic, and we'd have about fifteen kids. He had a ranch outside of town, and and he had about fifteen kids. I'd come and coach every year, and and generated a little income. Well, he he's the one that gave me the idea that you should be doing a videotape, and I said. Well, if you do it, I'll do it, you know. And it started there. And, and Dave did a lot of videotapes, probably before anyone did. Mm. Um, he ended up working at USA Wrestling. Um, uh, he's he's been around for a long time, been very instrumental in a lot of the the early tapes and a lot of the early some of the great matches, you know, that he's got that he has on tape. He's got a he's got a uh, a library of tapes. It's phenomenal. Wow. I mean. If you ever want to go see something or see some matches that you haven't seen, he's got them. And I'm talking about the dual meets back then, uh, all of them. The Team USA Russia ones? Yeah, all of Huge. them. Huge. Yeah. And so um, he's done a great service for, uh, for wrestling um, because he preserved a lot of things that, um, that really mean a lot to people. So, um, yeah, just he started it, and, and it was a hit for me, and... Um, it was exciting, you know, um, just to have something out there that could generate a little more income for you. How'd you come up with the name? Um, I think Dave Mil I think Dave Bennett came up with it. Wow. Yeah, I think he was he was real interested in me, and he and he took you know, you know he he allowed me to train there at his place there in Washington while we were doing the camp and I'd always bring a couple guys up and we I'd have training partners and we'd be we'd be teaching all day and in between we would be doing um, workouts and it, it'd be a 16 hour day but um, uh, you know it was a, a great opportunity for us to make extra money yeah and at the camp, same time you're doing a bunch of camps how many camps were you doing at the peak in the 80s 
not as many as you think, you know, um, because, uh, you know, at the beginning of that, it was exciting, you know. Um, towards the end of my career, it was draining. So, you know, I think, you know, going out and early on, you know, is I could, I mean, I, I was running hard, man. I was, but by running hard, I was also, body was getting stronger and tougher and, you know, but it was just exciting. I just remember those earlier years, it was exciting going to, you know, you walk into 400 kids and their eyes are on you and you're like, wow, you know, what, what did I do? You know, well, you won a world championship, John. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, um, and, and probably even after my first Olympics, you know, it was just real exciting to me. And, and there was a level of, of, there was a level of, of me that was just like, I want, it's, this is, I'm making some real money, you know, um, and I never had money, you know, um, and I think anytime you're making some money, real money, it's exciting. You know, it's, 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 you know, you just don't want to make the wrong mistakes, take the wrong steps, you know, and I did that, you know, and I think after, after, uh, I got back after 88, um, my, my time, I got real stingy with it after that loss in Cuba. You know, I got real stingy and going, what are you doing here? What are we going to do here? And then I'd, I'd, I'd do maybe a few few a year, and I, I really backed way off of it because... Um, That's a grind. Well, it was a grind, and it's hard, you know, you, you're, you're getting offered some, some money that's just like, you know, that's, that's a real difference. You know, I can buy more land, you know. <laughs> um, more cattle. Uh, yeah. And, um, but it, it ended that, that, it ended in, in Cuba. So this is... I backed way, way off. This is that same time. I love, this is the last interview I'll show you. I found this on a 1990 World Cup clip and they interview you and this is where I'm like, oh, there's something that happened where the money and all the distractions got to a point where you couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. I set a goal every day just to get up and work out, you know, and to train hard. I've got to stay motivated every day. Um, for me to continue wrestling, it's daily goals. It's not. It's not something to set a goal to be a world champion in 1991. It's. It's the goal to, 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 to concentrate on my my skills, concentrate on my conditioning because uh, you have a tendency now. I'm feeling and and no one can explain this to me because no one's been where I've been. It's tough to get motivated now to get up every day like you've been doing in the past to train as hard as you've always trained to win a world champ because you've already won one. That don't mean I don't love the sport and I want to retire. I want to wrestle. I don't want to train as hard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a moment in time. It's like a time capsule. Yeah. Just all that kind of coming to a head. Because that was right before, right well, after. Well, it's just what are you going to do, you know? You think about it, and, you know, and um, it never was about the money for me. You know, I, I would say early on in my career, um, it was just nice making some money. You know, I mean, not that these guys make today, you know, but I mean, $500 was just like, what? You know, $500 would take care of my whole month, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and, and you're going to give me this, for, come for a weekend, you know, um, you know, I was just like, you know, that kind of excitement, you know, um, but I knew real quickly that the two didn't mix for me, you know. I did a lot better when I was when I'm poor than I do when I'm when I have money, yeah. you know. So, um, and you're going to lose those years, right? I mean, so many people lose the years because they're they're chasing something that really doesn't matter, you know. Just go win, and and you're going to get whatever you want. The things that you want, you're going to eventually get them, and and you know, hopefully, it's not as simple as money, but um, uh, you know, it's it's the things you truly want, and, and that's to be satisfied. I'm proud of my career. I'm proud of my, you know, I'm proud of my teams. I'm proud of my coaching. You know, in the end, you're going to get everything you want. You know, and um, for me, you know, I had to back off because it was just it was too much. You know, too many things were happening, and too much responsibility goes into 
you know, back then to make money as a wrestler, there was too many responsibilities you had to have extra to make money. Now, these guys, you know, don't have to, they go in and it's a good, they got great opportunities. Not that I didn't. Yeah. It was just different. Name of the podcast, Wrestling Changed My Life. I've been waiting to ask you this since the first time I interviewed you. How did wrestling change your life? Then we'll cut everything. Well, it's changed my life in so many ways. I mean, I mean, I don't even know where to start with that, you know. Um, growing up in a family of 10, you know, wrestling changed my life growing up from, from being in a family of 10, you know. Um, you know, just, um, you know, I mean, to coaching, wrestling's changed my life, you know, as a coach, uh, as a parent. I mean, it's just too, it's too, you can't narrow me down to one thing, you know, it's just like, it's, it's humbled me throughout my career, like anything that I've needed, right? Um, from the time I started, it's humbled me, you know, and, and rec recognize there's, there's, there, there, there's this, this sport uh, can put you to your knees if you're not careful. You know, um, you know, so if I really had to say one particular thing of changing my life, um, um, I just have to say this, you know, it, it's, it's, it gave me every uh, value of how to set goals. Wrestling's taught me how to set a goal and how to go after it. You know, and whether that is raising your children, having a relationship with your wife, having a relationship with your friends, you set these goals and things throughout every day that have nothing to do that's related with wrestling. And I attack it like I, like I did as a wrestler. You know, I'm setting a goal and I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to find a way to accomplish it. And, and, that when you, and, and when you find ways to accomplish it, you're going to have to be humble. You're going to have to be respectful. Um, you're going to have to honor people, respect people. Um, you're going to have to go through all those those characteristics to, you know, just to accomplish a goal. And, and so for me, you know, I, I've learned how to set goals through the sport and, and accomplishment that has nothing to do with wrestling. Love it. Yeah. Coach, thank yeah. you, sir. You, you bet. You were in rare form today. It was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And that's the end of this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Thank you so much for tuning in. To watch the full video interview, go to YouTube Wrestling Changed My Life. And that's it. We'll see you next time.